بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و بھی نستعین صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای یا رسول اللہ و علی اہل بیتک المدلومین صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی یا مولای مولای و ابن مولای یا ابا عبداللہ یا رحمت اللہ الواسعہ و یا باب نجات العمہ یا غریب یا مذلوم یا اچان کربلا ما خواب من تمسک بکم والامین من لجا الیکم سادتی یا لیتنا یا لیتنا کنا ماکم فنفوزا واللہ فوزا عظیم قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة ومن يقترف حسنة ومن يقترف حسنة نزد له فيها حسنا إن الله غفور شكور آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وعلى محمد If there's any women who are coming coming in from the door to my right there's a lot of space all the way up in the front you can come all the way to the front you have a nice view it's very comfortable you can even get a chance to sit against the wall there's just a lot of space and if people are not going to move up then I'm just going to ask for people who are uncomfortable in the back if they can move up so then people who are coming in late that they can take a seat in the back without disrupting any of you. It's not gonna, it's not gonna bother me. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tonight is obviously the night of Ashura. And I don't want to sit here and lecture you for very long. But I thought that tonight we should speak about one of the most important verses within the whole of Quran. The verse known as Ayatul Mawadda. The verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands love of the Prophet and his family to the believers. And before I get into the discussion around this verse of the whole Quran, it's important to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has revealed the Quran for us so that we reflect upon it. That we sit in front of the Quran and we see questions from it in the ability that it gives us answers. The idea is to allow for ourselves to enter into a state of exploration of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this night, the night of Ashura, when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he tells the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad that allow for me to not fight on the 9th of Muharram, but allow for, me to, allow for us to postpone the battle until the 10th of Muharram. And we'll get into the details around that later. He tells Abu al-Fadl Abbas to go and tell Umar ibn Sa'ad, give us this one final night, لِأَنِّي أُحِبُّ الصَّلَاةِ وَتِلَاوَتْ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ That I want this last night in order that I'm able to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I love prayers. And because I want this last night so that I can dedicate it in recitation to the Holy Qur'an, recitation of the Holy Qur'an. Tonight is a night of aza. Tonight is a night of grief. Tonight is a night of pain. Tonight is a night of agony. Yes, all of those things. But we also have the opportunity to allow for a portion of this night to be in dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's exactly how Hussein salam Allah alayhi that he, the way that he spent this night was in prayers as in, and was in recitation of the whole Qur'an. If you've never performed the night prayer before, let tonight be that night. And take the blessing of Sayyidah Shahada al Hussein alayhi salam that you make a promise and a commitment to him that you are walking in his footsteps to get closer toward God. Because as we've been mentioning for the last 10 nights, the only thing that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam seeks on the 10th of Muharram was proximity toward his Creator. That's what it's all about. The only, thing that he the only thing that he thought of 
and every moment on the day of Ashura was pleasing his Lord. So let's allow for this night to also be that night in which we seek proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using the vessel, by using the medium, by using the agent of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam. And why not? For the narration states, Inna al Hussein misbahun huda wa safinatun najat, that surely Hussein is the lantern of guidance and the ship of salvation. And a man, he comes toward Imam al Sadiq. And he states, Ya ibn Rasulullah, O grandson of the Messenger of God, are you not all the lanterns of guidance? And are you not all the arcs of salvation? Aren't all of Ahlul Bayt the means by which we get closer toward God? He states, Of course we are. Walakin in safinat al Hussein aw sa'awa asra. Yes, every single one of us are the means by which you can get toward God. But surely the ship of Hussein is the most spacious. And it's the quickest way toward getting to paradise. And we're a people who just always want to look out for shortcuts. And the shortcut is in front of us. It's our master, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Salamu alayhi. So don't take these gatherings for granted. Don't take these opportunities and feel that they are unimportant. An opportunity to remember Hussein, salamu alayhi is an opportunity to allow for one foot to enter into his paradise. For he is the king of paradise. He is Sayyid Shabab Ahl al-Jannah. And for today's discussion, insha'Allah, again, I want to reflect upon the verse of Mawadda, which is chapter 42 of the Holy Qur'an, verse number 23, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ لَا أَسْعَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى وَمَنْ يَقْتَرِفْ حَسَنَةً نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا حُسْنًا And I want to reflect upon this verse of the Holy Qur'an which commands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet to instruct that his community loves the family of the Messenger of God alayhi salatu wa salam in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the commentary of the verse of Mawadda chapter 42 verse number 23. The second dimension is in terms of understanding the manifestations of love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam. And thirdly, in terms of understanding what the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam yield for us in this world before even the next. So let's go ahead and take a look at this verse of the Holy Quran and try to understand exactly the depth and the meaning of it, especially on this blessed night, the night of Ashura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say, O Messenger of God, that when they come to you and when they ask you, what is it that they can do for you? Tell them that the only thing that you want in terms of reward for the effort that you have put forth to spread the message is that they love your family. Before we get into the specifics and the dynamics of this verse of the Holy Qur'an, it's important to understand what is known as the reason for revelation of this particular verse, or what is known as the sabab and nuzul as scholars of Qur'an would state. When we take a look at different verses of the Holy Qur'an, we see that many of them, we are given a context of why it is that it was revealed. But then we also have a whole host of other verses of the Holy Qur'an in which we're not exactly sure the reason why it was revealed. But for those verses of the Holy Qur'an that we have an idea, meaning we have the reason for revelation, it's important that we apply it upon that verse in order that we're able to maximize the benefit that we're taking from it. And when it comes to our chapter 42, verse number 23, it is stated that many people from the Muhajireen and the Ansar went toward the Prophet السلام, on numerous occasions in the holy city of Medina. And they went toward the Prophet and they said, O oh, Messenger of God, you have brought us from darkness into light. You have brought us out of ignorance and into knowledge. You have done so much for us. And what better blessing and what better honor than you digging our souls out of that darkness and teaching us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What better gift do we have than we are exposed to the light of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam.
There is no better blessing than that. We mentioned the other night that there's a supplication that we're taught to recite which states, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alani min ummati Muhammad. Oh Allah, all thanks and all praise is due to you for you have made us from amongst the people of the greatest of God's creation. We know the Prophet. We're exposed to the light of the Messenger of God. What better blessing than that? His character and his akhlaq and his words and his wisdoms, which continue to be a gift that keep on giving. So many people, they came toward the Prophet and they said, Oh Rasulullah, what can we give you? They tried to give him wealth. They tried to give him food. They tried to give him really expensive and lavish gifts. They tried to invite him over for food. They tried to do a whole host of different things in order that they were able to express their gratitude toward the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. But the Prophet Alaihi Salaam, he consistently said no. Don't worry about it. I don't need anything. I don't do this for anything except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm doing this because it's my responsibility. I'm doing this because I'm a messenger. I'm doing this because I'm a prophet. I'm doing this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me this task and I'm happy to do it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He came. And He commands the messenger of God alayhi salatu wa salam to not refuse when people come toward him, he states, Qul. Qul means to say, meaning it's a direct commandment from the Creator, in which he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of God, when they come to you, you don't have to be humble. I'm going to speak on your behalf. Say, Qul, La as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al mawaddata fil qurba that I do not ask for anything in recompense for putting forth this effort of spreading the message except that you love my family. Meaning it's a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not something that came from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam himself. A couple of different points before we move on to the second dimension. What's the evidence to suggest that this verse of the Holy Quran is actually commanding the Messenger السلام, toward commanding his community, meaning the Muslims, toward loving the family of the Prophet. السلام. Because when we come and take a look at the Arabic language, when we take a look at the verse of the Holy Quran, it states, Qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran, that I do not want anything as a reward or as a recompense, illa al mawaddata fil qurba, except for love of the qurba. Yesterday, last night, when we were talking about what it means to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I stated that we make an intention before the performance of any one of our prayers, which states, Qurbatan ila Allahi ta'ala. I am doing this to seek closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the word? Qurbatan. What is the, what is the word in the verse of the Holy Quran? La, qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al mawaddata fil qurba. Qurba in the Arabic language comes from the root word qariba or qarib, which is something close. Which is why when we state qurbatan in Allah, we're asking God for His closeness, for His proximity. So there are some individuals who come and we they state that when the Messenger alayhi salam is commanded to say qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al mawaddata fil qurba, he's not saying that I'm commanding you to love my family. He's saying, I'm commanding you to love qurba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you should love in reality, what? To seek closeness to God. But when we take a look at scholars of the Arabic language, they come and they state that that, that would not be the word that God would apply if it meant seeking closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For it would state, for instance, taqarrub, not qurba. This is one point. A second point would be, as taken by some commentators of the Holy Quran, that when the Prophet ﷺ states, لا أسألكم عليه أجراً إلا المودت في القربة, that I do not want anything from you except that you love family, that you love قربة. قربة doesn't mean my family in the Arabic language. It doesn't say أقربائي. It says قربة, meaning that if you love the Prophet and if you want to serve the Messenger ﷺ, and if you want to thank him for everything that he has done for you, then go and love your own families. Go and perform. Salatul Arham, for instance. Go and tell your parents that you love them, your spouse that you love them, your children that you love them. 
But again, when you take a look at the context of the verse, people are coming toward the Prophet They're saying, O Messenger of God, we are so indebted to you. Imagine the Prophet says, now you go and love your family. First of all, it doesn't make any sense. It's not befitting for that sort of context. And furthermore, we come toward the third opinion, and that's the opinion of the majority of Muslims, Shi'i or Sunni, doesn't make a difference, who take the unanimous opinion due to also numerous ahadith and traditions of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, that are narrated within Sunni texts by a man by the name of Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, the same narrator of Hadith al-Kisa, or Sa'id ibn al-Jubair, and the mutawatir of the ahadith from the scholars of the Shia, which state that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam to state, لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة, that I don't want anything from you except that you love this family. That family that he's speaking about is Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein. Peace and everlasting blessings be upon all of them. And again, numerous ahadith and numerous traditions, they direct us toward this conclusion, in which one day it is said that after the passing of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, after his head had been struck on the 19th of the holy month of Ramadan, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba alayhi salam, he went to the mosque of Kufa, and he recites a sermon toward all of the Muslims, and he begins to tell them that did not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command love of us? In this verse of the Holy Quran, when he states toward the Messenger, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Yet what have you done toward our father Ali ibn Abi Talib? Furthermore, on the day when the caravan of Imam Zain al-Abideen and Lady Zainab, peace and blessings be upon them, was outside of the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, it is stated that there was a bunch of men who were standing on top of balconies in Damascus who began to throw rocks at the Imam, salam Allah alayhi, Imam Zain al-Abideen. As the Imam's hands were tied and as all of the women, they had been taken from Karbara to Kufa and from Kufa to Damascus and they were abused for three days before they entered into the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. It is said that on that particular occasion a man had come and he had taken a lantern that was lit with fire and thrown it on top of the head of Imam Zain al-Abideen And you know what was so tragic about that? Was that the Imam salam, tried to remove the fire that was on his head but his hands were tied. He was unable to do so. So he had to move his head so that lantern of fire would fall to the ground. It is said that one man, he was walking in the streets and he begins to mock all of the women and children of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, and Imam Zain al-Abideen says, Oh man, come here. That man come, came toward Imam Zain al-Abideen not knowing that he's the grandson of the Messenger of God. And he states, do you read the whole Quran? He says, of course, I'm Muslim. He states, have you read the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْحِبَ أَنْكُمْ رُجْسَ أَحْلُ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَحِرَكُمْ تَتْهِرًا He says, of course I've read that verse. He says, that's us. And then he said, have you read the verse of the whole Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ لَا أَسْعَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى He said, of course I've read that verse. He says, then God has commanded you to love us and look at the way that you're treating my aunt Zainab. So when we talk about the word qurba within this verse, again, our unanimous opinion is that that qurba is in honor of the family of the Messenger of God. Peace and blessings be upon them. The second question that we want to ask within this verse is then what is the word mawadda mean? قُلْ لَا أَسْعَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى That the only thing that I ask for you in recompense for the effort that I have put forth is that you have mawadda to my family. Within the Arabic language, there are numerous words for love. There is the word hub, there is the word ishq. But in this verse of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has applied the term mawadda. Within the Arabic language, again, all of these numerous terms that are mentioned, every single one of them has a very precise meaning. 
And it's important to understand that when God applies any particular word in the whole Qur'an, it's not out of any coincidence. But rather there's a depth and rather there's a meaning to why it is that he applies certain words over others. He doesn't state, for instance, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَحَبَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Mahabba from Hub. He states mawadda. And again, scholars of language, they're going to come forth and they're going to state that the word Hub is a love that you can have, but it's a love that you can contain. It's a love that you don't necessarily have to express to someone, but it's something that's already known. You don't always need to tell your spouse that you love them. You don't always need to tell your parents that you love them. You don't always need to tell your children that you love them. But there's a sense of innate love that's within our hearts and within our souls. It's good to express it, but it's not always something that is so commonly expressed because it's something that is known. It's something that is understood. And even within the whole Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands this particular object of love toward Ahlul Bayt salam, it's not limited toward that most basic level of love. Rather, it's on the, this higher level of love, again known as mawadda. This type of love is the love that's not only demonstrated by the words that I say, but it's the love that overcomes and consumes our bodies. And it's a way whereby we cannot control except to express our love for the personality that is the object of our affection. When it comes toward Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, there is no bounds to our love. When it comes toward the Prophet and his family alayhi salatu wasalam, there is no bounds to our love. We love the family of the Messenger of God far more than we love our spouses and our parents and our children, which is, we, which is why we state, Ya Aba Abdullah bi Abi anta wa ummi, that may my mother and my father be sacrificed for you. And as we recite in Ziyarat al Jama'a al Kabira, bi Abi antum wa ummi wa nafsi wa mali wa ahli. That, O oh, Ahlul Bayt al Nubuwa, O oh, family of the Messenger of God, may my mother and my father and my wealth and my property and my children all be in ransom for you. That's mawadda, taking love toward that sense of level whereby we can't control our expression of it. And the verse of the Holy Quran, it continues, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states, وَمَنْ يَقْتَرِفْ حَسَنَةً نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا خُسْنَا He states, and the one who performs a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase him or her in that goodness. What is the good deed? What is the hasana that God is speaking about? Again, he's speaking about mawadda of Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu wa So when you demonstrate that sense of love, for the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them. It's a good deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow for it to be multiplied. And God mentions within the whole Quran that the one who does one hasana, the one who does one good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply that by 10. When you shed one tear for Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, on a night like this one, what's the reward in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَمَنْ يَقْتَرِفْ حَسَنَةً نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا خُسْنَا That God will be the one who will multiply the reward on your behalf. And this brings me then toward the second dimension. And these are to the expressions of love of Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu wasalam. What are these expressions of mawadda that we can potentially put on portrayal for the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, for the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa and we have two that are demonstrated within our ahadith and within our tradition. The first one of these portrayals of love is probably what we can understand as the emotional love that we have toward Ahlul Bayt When I sit here in front of you all and I recite a eulogy in honor of Imam al Hussein in honor of Ali al Akbar, in honor of Qasim, in honor of the children or the brothers of Hussein peace and blessings be upon them. Or I recollect the tragedy of Zainab, Salamullah alayha. 
Or even aside from this, you're reading poetry on your own, or you're writing poetry, or you're listening to the poetry. Or you're sitting alone, and you're recollecting the thirst of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Or you see your own children, and you see when they're going through a hard time, and that allows for you to remember the hard time of the children of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Or when you stand in front of the shrine, the mausoleum of Sayyid al Shahada, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, and you let your heart pour out. Or when you recite the ziyara that we're going to recite tomorrow on the day of Ashura, and you say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. And your tears begin to flow, and your heart begins to break, and that shattering takes place. Whereby you realize that you're just a servant from the servants of our master, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, Salamu alayhi. That grief and that love and that intensity and that emotion, that in itself has a reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is evident, this is obvious. That if you love Abi Abdullah al Hussein, you love Ahlul Bayt, salamullah alayhim, you hear the fadail and the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib, salamullah alayh. That if you hear these things and if you speak about these things, it creates a sense of our hearts racing a little bit faster. And those goosebumps that come on your skin. The minute that you hear a little bit of the tragedy of Sayyid al-Shahada al-Hussein alayhi salam, even if you don't do any other good deed, that deed has reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone says they don't pray, they don't fast, they don't go for hajj, they don't perform any other good deeds. Is love of the Prophet and his family alayhim wassalam, a good deed? Yes. And it's a good deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not eradicate with all of the other bad deeds that we do. As the narration states, حُبُّ عَلِيٍّ حَسَنًا لَا تَضُرُّ مَأَهَا سَيِّئًا That the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is a deed, is a reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no matter how many bad deeds that you do, you still have that good deed. What an honor. That doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immediately going to whip open the doors of paradise for us because solely of our love of Ali alayhi salam. But that reward is there for us just because of the expression of love that we have. You think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't reward you for coming to this majlis for 10 nights in a row? You think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't reward you for your tears, won't reward you for your exhaustion, won't reward you for your volunteering, won't reward you for your hard work, won't reward you for your solidarity to the son of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam? Who do we think that these personalities are? Kareemun min awlaad al-kiram wa ma'murun bidhiyafati wal ijara We address them. We state that you are from the lineage of the most generous. You give a little bit to someone who's generous, they're going to return that favor in a really big fashion. And we're talking about the most generous of the generous, that's Ali and his children. What are we talking about? But again, that's not the objective. The objective is not that I shed a tear. It's not that I just weep for Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. It's that I take that love that we have, that mawadda that we have for Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, and allow for us to reach that second manifestation of love, and that's the transformative love that these gatherings have to offer for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى That I do not want anything from you except that you love my family. On one level we can love by coming to these gatherings and wearing black clothes and shedding tears and beating our chests and doing everything in the way of our master Hussein, salam Allah alayhi. But at the second level, that love has to transcend into doing something or being something that resembles the values and the qualities of Sayyid al-Shahada al-Hussein alayhi salam. That allows for us to resemble the altruism of Abdul Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. The hadith it states, then may Allah have mercy upon the scream that was made in honor of us. We're scared to shed a tear for Imam al Hussein because you're worried about what the person to your right or to your left or your friend or your family member is going to think about you. 
Mawadda is what God commanded to us in the Quran. And that mawadda is something that is demonstrated on our body. And then performance of that sense of love, the, the illumination or the manifestation of that sense of love is a mechanism for transformation of the heart and of the soul, which allows for this being of ours to become Husseini in the true meaning of it, which is to walk in the footsteps of Sayyid al-Shahada, Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. You're following what I'm saying? And this brings me then to the third dimension of my discussion. And I'll conclude with this, and I won't keep, keep you long. Because you're not here for me to lecture. You're here to demonstrate that mawadda. You're here to show that sense of love. So then what do these notions of mawadda yield for the one who truly has love for the Prophet and his family? Alayhim salatu wasalam. Two things. Number one, is that the one who has true mawadda for the Prophet and his family, alayhim salatu wasalam, they are ready at any moment to channel their happiness to the happiness of Ahlul Bayt and their grief to the grief of Ahlul Bayt. Alayhim salatu wasalam, as Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rada, salamullah alayhi, he tells his companion Rayyan ibn Shabib, Inna in sarraka an takuna ma'ana fi darajat al-ula min al-jinan, fahzan li huznina, wafrah li farahina, wa alayka bi wilayatina, falaw anna rajulan ahabba hajaran, la hasharahu allahu ma'ahu yawm al qiyama. He states, O oh my companion ibn Shabib, that if you desire to be with us in the highest levels of paradise, then make sure that you are happy when we are happy. And make sure that you are in a state of grief when we are in a state of grief. And make sure that you hold steadfast toward our authority. And then he continues and he states, for surely if someone loves a rock, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise him with that rock on the day of judgment. But we tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we love Hussein, so raise us with Hussein on the day of judgment. And the second manifestation, the second sort of spectrum of what this love, what this mawadda yields for the one who has intense love for Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam is that we desire to share that love of our masters to others. The story of Hussein is not something that we keep to ourselves. The story of Hussein is something that we share to our friends, that we share to our colleagues, that we share to our family members. Because it offers us insight in bravery and in loyalty and in courage and in patience and in generosity and in compassion and in mercy and in justice and in beauty and in love. As Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he tells his companion Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, Habibuna ila nas wa la tabghibuna ilayhim jarru ilayna kullu muwaddah. He states that allow for people or bring our love to other people. And don't allow for them to hate us. That means we have the potential to allow for people to have animosity to Ahlul Bayt with the words that we speak, with the etiquette and the actions that we perform. And then he states, and allow for our mawadda, this intense love, bring people toward it. Because once they see the character and they see the essence and they see the perfection of the family of the Messenger of God, why would they not love Ahlul Bayt? My dear brothers and sisters, tonight is a night again in which I said that I'm not here to educate you or lecture you in any way. Rather, what I spoke to was just a primer. In order for us to understand that tonight is a night of that pain and that agony that was felt by the family of the Prophet A day that was foreshadowed in the heavens. A day that was spoken about 2,000 years before the creation of Adam. That the angels, they dreaded this day. The jinn, they dreaded this day. The throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dreaded this day. 
from the day that the Prophet والسلام, saw his son Hussein ibn Ali السلام, born, the first thought that came to his mind is what's going to happen to my son on the 10th of Muharram, 61 years after Hijrah. He's going to be alone on a desert. There's going to be no one surrounding him. And there's going to be no one with him. And the only thing that is going to be surrounding him are swords and spears and rocks and 30,000 people ready to shed his blood in the name of the Messenger of God. O Messenger of God, forgive us, we could not have been there with you. But we swear by your beloved Fatima of Zahra alayha salatu wasalam that every year that we live on this night we will be ready to demonstrate our solidarity and loyalty to you. And we're unable to do so with swords or with spears or even with our own chests or with our own bodies so we'll do so with our voices and we'll do so with our tears and we'll do so with our screams in kana lam yujib kabadani in nastansarik wa lisani in nastaghathatik faqad ajabaka qalbi wa sam'i wa basari labayka ya da'i Allah as we recite in one of the ziyarat of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, O oh, our master Aba Abdullah, when you called out that line, Hal min Nasir, we were not there to respond toward your call, not with our tongues nor with our bodies. So here we are, Faqad ajabaka qalbi wa sam'i wa basari. So here is my heart, and here are my ears, and here are my eyes, everything that I can give for you. O oh, Aba Abdullah, tonight is the night in which we are going to demonstrate that sense of mawadda for you. Tonight is the night of Ashura. And it is said that toward the end of this evening before the time of Maghrib, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he heard the trumpets of war beginning to blow. And he calls up in Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam, and Umar ibn Sa'd's army was getting ready toward ransacking the family of the Messenger of God alayhi salam on the plains of Karbara. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he calls Abu al-Fadl Abbas and he says, Oh my dear brother, he says, go toward the army of Amr bin Sa'ad and tell them to give us this last evening because I love prayers and because I love to recite Quran. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam dispatches Abu al-Fadl Abbas. He goes toward Umar bin Sa'ad's army. He says, my brother Hussein alayhi salam has said that if you're going to kill us, then give us this one last night that we're able to take care of our affairs, that we're able to pray to our Lord, that we're able to recite Quran. Give us this night and tomorrow in the morning, you do what you have to do. And when Umar bin Sa'ad, he thought about it for a second and he said, it doesn't make a difference for us today or tomorrow. Either way, we are going to serve Yazid ibn Ma'awiyah with the head of Abi Abdullah al Hussein sooner or later. So he lets Abu al-Fadl Abbas go, he comes back. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he gathers together all of his companions. He gathers together all of his family members. He has them seated and he begins to recite a sermon in which he commands them toward taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which he advises them and he thanks them for all of their service up till now. And then he says, oh my dear companions, let me tell you something. He said, I am foretelling and I am promising that tomorrow, every single one of you who remain with me on this night, you are going to be killed on this battlefield. So I am telling you, oh my companions, and oh my family members, and oh my friends, please take the hands of your closest family members, leave this tent, Go back toward Medina, go back toward Mecca, to go back toward Kufa. I promise you that no one will harm you. The only thing that they want is to shed my blood. You know what Imam al-Hussein did? He went toward the children of Muslim ibn Aqil. He went to the brothers of Muslim ibn Aqil and he said, you already lost Muslim, that's enough, go back. He even went to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He says, oh my brother Abbas, take the hands of your brothers and go back. They're not gonna hurt you, they're not gonna harm you. The only thing that they want is me. And at that moment he said, every one of you go, the only one who remains is my son Ali al-Akbar. He will be by my side tomorrow and we will be okay. 
and he looked at every single one of them and they all were staring at Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he instructs Ali al Akbar, he says, turn off all of the lanterns, all of the candles in this tent, and in the case that any one of you have any sort of shame or embarrassment, go and leave in the darkness of the night, and I promise you I will not judge you, you have a place in paradise, barakallah fikum. It is said that he turns off those lanterns, and a few moments later he asks Ali al Akbar to light it again, and every single one of those faces are staring at Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Zuhair ibn al Qain, he stands up and he says, Oh Aba Abdullah al Hussein, I promise you and I swear to you that if they were to take my body and they were to cut it up into a thousand pieces and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to resurrect me a thousand times for you, oh Aba Abdullah, even if there was no hope in paradise, for you, O oh Hussein, I'd give my life. <laughs> Muslim ibn Awsaja, he stands up, he's in his 80s, he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, as long as I have the ability to hold the spear, I will continue to pluck the chests in your way, Oh Aba Abdullah. At that moment, Habib ibn Madahir stands up. At that moment, soon after that, John stands up. One by one, the companions of Imam al Hussein they express their loyalty in this demonstration of bravery and courage in honor of their master, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Alayhi salatu was salam. The Imam alayhi salam, he thanks all of them for their service. And he tells them, go, utilize this last night. Go talk to your family. Go spend time with your children. Go and recite Quran. Go and make prayers. We'll prepare for tomorrow. We'll see you in the morning, inshallah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he exits the tent. And it is said that he begins to walk around in the sand. And he's looking toward the army of Amr bin Sa'ad and they're all celebrating of what is going to soon happen only 12 or 14 hours from this moment that we are in right now, O oh fellow Shia. And it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he's kneeling down by the ground and he's picking up some rocks and he's throwing it to the side, he's reflecting, he's contemplating. And at that moment he hears some footsteps behind him. He turns around and it's one of his companions, a man by the name of Nafa ibn Hilal. He says, oh Nafa, what are you doing here? And Nafa says, oh Aba Abdullah. He said, I'm afraid that one of the arrows from the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad are going to see you and I don't want them to kill you. And then he says, oh Aba Abdullah, but what are you doing out here alone? Do you know what Imam al Hussein, according to one of the report states? He says, oh Nafa. He says, do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? He says, yes, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. That every one of our lives are going to be ransomed in your way. He says, no, Nafir, I'm not talking about that. He said, tomorrow after we die, the horses are going to come and begin to burn these tents of my women and of my children, and they're gonna have nowhere to go. So I'm picking up rocks from the sand, throwing it to the side so that their feet don't get don't get scratched by these rocks, but I tell you, oh, Abba Abdullah, do you know what Shimr did to Zainab on the night of the 11th of Muhammad? <laughs> Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, oh, Nafa, he says, do you see those two hills? Why don't you go and slip through them, go back toward Kufa, go see your family, go see your friends. You don't have to be with me today. You know what he says? He says, Oh Aba Abdullah, I would let the wild beasts of this land kill me if I were not to defend you on the 10th of Muharram. Oh Aba Abdullah, there is no way that I'm going to leave. At this moment, Aba Abdullah and Hussein, he embraces Na'fa ibn Hilal. He says, you go back toward the tent, you prepare for tomorrow, you read, you pray, you do whatever it is that you have to do. And Na'fa ibn Hilal, he exits from that gathering, and is when he is leaving, Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she exits from the tent. And Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she comes toward Aba Abdullah al Hussein, and she says, Oh Aba Abdullah, tell me, do you know a sister who is better than I? And Imam al Hussein says, Oh Zainab, there is no sister as good as you. To which Imam al Hussein says, Oh Zainab, do you know a brother who is better than I? To which Zainab says, no, Abba Abdullah, I don't know a brother better than you. They want to talk about what's going to happen tomorrow, but Zainab alayhi salam doesn't have the expression or the words to tell Abba Abdullah al Hussein. So she's just doing her best toward expressing her love for her master, Abba Abdullah, in this way. And they begin conversing for a few moments until Zainab alayhi salam says, Oh, Abba Abdullah, are you worried about your companions? Are you sure that they're going to be loyal to you tomorrow? 
And as she is uttering these words, Nafi ibn Hilal, who's walking back to the tent, he overhears the words of Zainab alayhi salam. So he rushes into the tent of Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir, he is the leader of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, while Abu al Fadl Abbas is the leader of Banu Hashim. He goes toward the tent of Habib ibn Madahir and he says, Oh Habib, when I was walking away from Aba Abdullah, I heard Zainab questioning our loyalty. Let us go and show her that we are there and that we will risk our lives for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. It is said that at that moment, Habib ibn Madahir, he was sharpening his sword and he looked toward those around him. He said, Let us all go and stand outside of the tent of Zainab and promise that we will give our life in honor of her brother. So it is said that every single one of them, the narration states, they charged out of the tent like roaring lions and they stood in front of the tent of Zainab calling out, Labaykiya Zainab, Labaykiya Aba Abdullah. Oh Zainab, you questioned our loyalty. Here we are for you. Oh Aba Abdullah, whatever you need, we are here for you. And oh Aba Abdullah and oh Zainab, we promise that we here in New York City we're also here for you though time and though destiny has separated us. We would give our life for you if we were there on the 10th of Muharram. <laughs> Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he exits from the tent again. He, he tells all of them, thank you so much. Leave the women and leave the children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward every one of you. They go back into the tent and they begin to pray and they begin to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is said there was, one, there was this man from amongst the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. His man was, this man, his name was Burair. Burair had, gone, had undergone a really difficult life. It was filled with trials and it was filled with tribulations. And on this night, he was seen laughing and he was seen smiling and he was seen in such a good sort of mood. Some of the companions came toward him and they said, Oh Burair, we've never seen you with this sense of joy, with this sense of contentment, with this sense of happiness. You know what he responds? Why would I not be happy when my life is in the service of my master, Aba Abdullah al Hussein? It is said that from the army of Amr bin Sa'd, they narrated that when we look toward the tent of Hussein alayhi salam on the tenth of Muharram, we only heard the buzzing of bees. We heard the recitation of adhkar and seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we saw the shadows of those standing and of those bowing and of those prostrating in dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear friends, Tonight is the night of Ashura. And tonight is the night during these hours in which Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he began to prepare the entire family, his entire group of companions and the contingency of army for battle. You know what he did, my dear brothers and sisters? It is said that as the morning of Fajr was about to approach, he dug a ditch around the tents and he put wood in that ditch and he lit that ditch on fire in the hope that no one from the army of Umar bin Sa'd would come and loot the tents of Zainab alayhi salam while they were in the course of fighting in battle. But I tell you, oh my dear friends, that Aba Abdullah al Hussein, that's the effort that he put forth on the tenth of Muharram because that's the only thing that he could have done in terms of protecting his women and his children. But oh Aba Abdullah, do you have any idea what they did to your women and to your children on the night of the eleventh of Muharram? Do we have any idea? Let's fast forward, my brothers and sisters. To the tragedy of tragedies. And this tragedy is narrated by a man by the name of Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, soon after the Battle of Karbala, some decades later, he went and made his strides toward capturing all of the enemies and all of those who killed the family of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and tried to put them through trial and through punishment. He caught Umar ibn Sa'ad, he caught Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and when he caught the greatest of all criminals, he was in conversation with him. And he said, I want you to tell me what happened on the 10th of Muharram. You know who that man was? That man was Hurmala ibn Kahid al-Asadi. 
He says, O oh, Hurmala, tell me, what did you do on the 10th of Muharram? He says, O oh, Muhtar, that I was from amongst those who were the leaders, who were from amongst the commanders of the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. And I had been appointed as the leader of the archers on the 10th of Muharram because of my precision in striking of the arrows. And he states that on the 10th of Muharram, that I struck seven arrows on that day of Ashura, three of them which missed their target, four of them which struck their target. Mukhtar says, O oh, Hurmala, then tell me, what are those four arrows that struck their target? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He says the first, the first arrow which struck its target was the arrow that struck the right eye of Abil Fadl al-Abbas on the day of Ashura. Abil Fadl al-Abbas had left the river Euphrates and he was going back toward the tent of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He was bringing back water for the children. The daughter of Hussein Sirkana was looking for her uncle to bring her back that water. And it is said that one man came and he struck the right arm of Abil Fadl al-Abbas. Another man came and he struck the left hand of Abil Fadl al-Abbas. At that moment it is said that Hurmala ibn Kahir says, I saw the white of the eye of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas from his helmet and I took that arrow and it went directly into the eye of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. A few moments later he fell down from his horse calling out Sayyidi wa Mawlai alayka minni salam. At this moment it is said that Mukhtar al taqafi he says, O oh, Hurmala then tell me what was that second arrow that struck its target on the 10th of Muharram? He said the second arrow that struck its target on the 10th of Muharram was the arrow that struck a man by the name, a boy by the name of Abdullah ibn Hassan. It is said that when the body of Aba Abdullah al Hussein had fallen down from the horse, no one had the courage to beheading the head of Imam al Hussein and taking him out of that state that he was in. So it is said that when Umar ibn Sa'ad, he commanded Shamr ibn Dil Joshan and others to go and take out the life of the Imam alayhi salam. Abdullah ibn Hassan, he was 13 or 15 years old. He runs out of the tent and he goes toward Aba Abdullah al Hussein and he says, O oh, son of the wicked man, are you going to kill my uncle? I'm an orphan. Is this the way that you're going to treat him? And at that moment, Hurmala ibn Kahil was told by Umar ibn Sa'ad, kill this boy before he creates a revolution in my army. So so they went and they struck that boy. You know what happens to Abdullah? He's the brother of Qasim. He looks toward his father. He looks toward his uncle Aba Abdullah. He says, Oh my uncle, what did they do to me? At this moment, Imam al Hussein, he looks toward his nephew and he says, Oh my nephew, don't worry, your father will meet you in paradise in just a few moments. <laughs> Mukhtar al Thaqafi, he says, O oh, Hurmala ibn Kahir, then tell me what was the third arrow that you struck on the day of Ashura? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to narrate this to you, O oh, my brothers and sisters. I'm sorry to narrate this, O oh, Sahib al Zaman. I'm sorry to narrate this, O oh, Fatima al Zahra. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. It is said that the third arrow that struck its target on the 10th of Muharram was the one that hurts me till this day. He said, what was that arrow? He said, it was the arrow that I usually strike to kill camels in the desert. But it was the one that I struck to kill the six month old of Abba Abdullah al -Hussein. He said, what happened to Hormala? He says, Abba Abdullah al Hussein. he exits from the tent after all of his family members had been killed. He went into the tent of his companions and no one was there. He went into the tent of his family members and no one was there. He went into the tent of Abba Fadl al Abbas and his brothers weren't there. So he went out into the middle of the place of Karbala and he called out, Hal min Is there anyone to help us on this day? At that moment I heard a call coming out, Lebeg. I turned around and I saw Zainab. 
Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he sees his sister Zainab, and Zainab says, Oh Abba Abdullah, you asked for a helper, and here I am. Imam al Hussein says, Oh Zainab, return back to the tent. You have a responsibility. So he goes back to the tent, he goes toward his sister Zainab, he embraces her, he begins to prepare himself for battle, and then as he's exiting the tent, he states, he hears the words of his sister Zainab calling out, Oh my brother, just wait one moment. Go and take this child and go and see if the army of Umar ibn Sa'd will give it one sip of water. I'll ask you, oh my friends, why is it that Rabab at that moment wasn't able to be the one who was holding her child? Because the Rabab was so exhausted. She was also dying of her thirst on the 10th of Muharram. And she had to watch her child literally allow for his eyes to fall into its sockets. At that moment, she could no longer bear to even stand after seeing the state of her child who was six months old. So he, she gives her to Zainab and says, Oh my, oh my sister Zainab, go and give this to Abba Abdullah and see if someone can save his life. But usually when a child is six months old, it drinks from the milk of its mother, but Rabab had no more milk. So it is said that at this moment, Abba Abdullah al Hussein, he looks towards Zainab and he states, Na wilini waladi al radi give me my six month old. He goes and he takes his cloth and he covers it and he begins to walk to the middle of the plains of Karbala. Again, I'm sorry. It is said that he takes that cloth and he covers it due to the intensity of the heat on the day of Ashura. And at that moment, he stood in the middle and he called out, O oh, army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, your issue is with no one but me. You have animosity toward me. I don't know why, but your issue is with me, not with this child of mine. So please, I beg you to give this child a sip of water. It is said that at this moment, he takes that child and he raises it up. And at this moment, he states, Usku sharbatan min al -ma. Just one sip of water, because I don't know what to tell his mother. Please give this child a sip of water. Any decency, any morality do you have, oh human beings, please give this child a sip of water. At this moment, it is said the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, some of them said it's just a child, give him a sip of water. Uh, others from the army, they said, let allow for everyone from the children of Hussein to be killed, even if he's a child. At this moment, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he looks for Hurmala ibn Kahil. Hurmala says at this moment, Umar ibn Sa'ad called me closer toward him. And he said, go and kill this child, because he is going to allow for the emotions of this army of mine to overcome me. So at that moment, he gave me the order. The arrow that I pulled out of my back was an arrow that kills camels. But camels, my brothers and sisters, they exist in the desert because they can contain water. It was a six-month-old child that didn't have any water. He took that arrow, he stayed. And I looked toward Amr ibn Saad and I said, who should I kill? Should I kill the child or should I kill the father? He says, go and take that arrow and allow for it to pierce through the neck of the child and hit the chest of the father. So Allahu Akbar! Hurmala ibn Kahal, he takes that arrow and he strikes it through the chest. Bin Walid al Walid. He decapitates the neck of the six month old Ali al Asra. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looks at this child which is filled with blood. He holds it closer toward the chest. One of the members from the army of Umar ibn Sa'd states that when that child had that arrow struck through its neck, it began to flap its, it began to flap its hands like a bird that's about to die. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looked toward the skies and he called out, Hawwana ma nazala bi, annahu fa'in Allah, that this is a lot easier because I know that God is watching. And then according to the narration, it states that he looks at the blood in his hands and he doesn't know what to do. So he looks toward the, he looks toward the ground and the ground as if it says that, oh Abu Abdullah, we can't contain this blood. So he looks up toward the sky and at this moment it said that Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Abu Abdullah, don't worry about the blood, nor worry about the child, because there's a maiden in paradise who will take care of him. But I tell you what, oh, 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 oh Shia, at this moment was the most challenging moment for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. He has the child in his hand, and he begins to walk. He doesn't know where he's walking, so he goes walking toward the army of Umar ibn Sa'd, and then he looks back toward the tent of Zainab, and it is said that he covers the child, and he begins to walk back toward the tent of the women, calling out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. رضاً بقضائه وتسليماً لأمره Oh Allah, if this is what you want, then keep on taking. If this is what makes you content, then I'm content. And it is said that when he enters, or when he gets closer toward the tent of Zainab, this is the daughters of Abba Abdullah al Hussein exit from the tent and says, Oh my father, Abba Abdullah, did you get water for my brother Adi in al-Asghar? Do you have some water for me? Imam al Hussein doesn't know what to say. So he removes his cloak and he shows the bloody child of his, he shows his bloody child toward his daughter. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he has a sense of sanctity for this child. So he goes behind the tent and he takes his sword and he begins to dig a grave and he places that child into that grave. You know what happens on the night of the 11th of Muharram, huh? <laughs> and at this moment it is said, that Khurmala ibn Kahir is asked by Mukhtar al Thaqafi. He said, The first arrow is the one that struck the right eye of Abil Fadl al Abbas. The second arrow is the one that struck Abdullah ibn Hassan. The third is the one that struck the six month old infant. What was that fourth arrow that struck on the day of Ashura? He says that that fourth arrow that struck on the tenth of Muharram was the arrow that I struck the chest of Abba Abdullah al Hussein in his final moments. Mukhtar says, Oh Abba Abdullah, tell me what happened. He said, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was sitting on the horse and he was tired. He had been picking up bodies from the morning until the evening. And at that moment, he looked toward us and he states, Bi jaddi Rasulullah, anni ajan. I swear by my grandfather Muhammad, I'm thirsty. Give me a sip of water. No one gave him a sip of water. He was taking a break as he was sitting on that horse. And all of a sudden, a man came and he he took a rock and it struck the head of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. And at that moment, the blood began to gush. So he took his shirt and he lifted it in order to wipe off the blood. I saw the chest of Hussein and I took that arrow and I pierced the chest of Imam al Hussein and he fell down from the horse. <laughs> Yo, Yo, Hussein! Call out with me, Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Your loudest voice, Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! Ya Hussein! While you're seated, recite with me. Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein. Keep reciting. Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Hussein, Wa Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, the son of Ali, the son of Zahra, all alone now, his final moments with his infant in Karbala, went to get a sip of water, came back bloody, the master of martyrs now doesn't have anyone, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Wa Husayna, 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 takes the sword of his father now, known as Ulfiqar, 
looks to the right and to the left, all abandoned, went to the middle of Karbala, so determined. He was so tired and so thirsty, yet he still fought. O oh, Hussein, now listen to our words as we call out, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Though we're not there, we swear by your mother Fatima that we will never forget you as long as we live. Our hearts break and our eyes bleed on this blessed night. Look to us now, O oh our Master, as we scream out, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. All my life I dedicate to you, O oh my Master. Please accept me, O oh the Son of the Holy Prophet. Please accept me, O oh the Son of the Holy Prophet. If you do not accept this humble slave, then where do I turn? You are my heart, you are my love, you are my life. You are my heart, you are my love, you are my life. On the day of judgment when the angels call out, What is your name and where are your deeds? We will respond, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna, Wa Husayna. Wa Husayna, please rise. Wa Husayna, 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 Wa Husayna.